Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Dr. Robert Galatly, the author of Hitler's True Believers, How Ordinary People Became Nazis. This is his 10th book. He's a professor at Florida State and is one of the leading historians of modern Europe. So thanks so much for being here, Professor. Entirely my pleasure. Well, we appreciate having you. Uh, this is not the most cheerful topic, uh, obviously, um, but what could be more important than understanding how a strong man becomes strong, how he wins over his countrymen and his women, country women. And we've all seen the pictures of thousands of adoring Nazis cheering and saluting Hitler as he made his appearances uh, during the Third Reich. So uh, who were those people and were they all true believers in everything he stood for, including genocide? Well, if that's the question, yeah. Um, in a way, of course, it's impossible if you look at a crowd, um, it's impossible to say what everybody's motive is in a crowd. Everybody has their own reason for being there, you know? Um, so it's impossible to cover everybody with a blank and say they're, they're all there because they love him or they love this part or they love that part or they embrace everything that he stands for. But what I wanted to do was to sort of get behind the crowds and Hitler and say, look, what, what was National Socialism or Nazism? What was this doctrine? And how did people, including Hitler, how did all the true, how did people come to uh, this doctrine and start to believe in it? So, for example, was it all Hitler? Did he convert them all? Did they listen to one of his speeches and say, oh my God, this is the answer? Uh, how did this uh, nation the most educated nation on earth at the time, and I can give you the stats to prove how many libraries they had and <laughs> so on and so forth. This is the most, this is why the trouble, the question is so troubling, is that this is the most educated nation on earth. It's not the most backward nation. So what led these people to national socialism? How did Hitler find it? Where did Hitler find it? You know, for many years, it's a, it was a cliche among historians that, um, that Hitler and the Nazi program was remarkable for being unoriginal. Well, in fact, if, <laughs> if you look at all the, pub, all the uh, political parties um, who were operating in Germany at that time, they were all remarkably unoriginal. I mean, none of, the, none of their programs read exactly like, you know, thrillers. So they're all pretty saney. But what is remarkable about it, uh, the Nazi program, is that it builds upon two of the most important ideas of the 19th and early 20th century, namely the power of nationalism and patriotism to attract people and the, uh, and the desire for social reform, for some kind of socialism. Call it what you want, socialism. And it's yeah. no accident, you see. That and we are. Party, oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. And it's no accident. No accident that the party ends up calling itself the National Socialist German. That is to say, nationalism twice. National Socialist German Workers Party. So it's trying to appeal to nationalism and socialism. And just very quickly, the people who came to uh, this, uh, these beliefs, uh, didn't need Hitler to convert them. They had been. Uh, thinking along these lines before Hitler existed. As one of these true believers said later, I was a national socialist long before the term existed. And we're definitely going to get to, uh, we're going to define those two terms because um, we, of course, hear them and think of them through a modern lens, but I think it will be valuable to, for us to all understand what they meant at that time and what they meant in Germany and to Hitler and to the people there. But let's just go back a little bit here. Um, and from reading your book, it's clear that conversations about Hitler have to have um, at least two components. Of course, there are many, but there are two, I think, essential ones just from reading your book. One of them is uh, Hitler himself and his history and where he came from and um, his early life. And one of the things you mentioned is that his early life did not have outward expressions of anti-Semitism. Um, certainly his political career took off once they did, but young Hitler did not 
um, uh, at, at least as far as we know, talk a lot about uh, anti-Semitism. So explain uh, his background um, and how he learned to be a leader and when and at what age. And one note before you answer, you caution on that word charismatic. Um, and I think that's an important thing because it's easy to say, well, he was just charismatic. Um, but you caution on that. So uh, explain Hitler, um, his history, when he became to lead, when he became uh, a leader and how. Well, Hitler, born in 1889 in, um, in a small provincial town on the border with Germany and Austria, um, his formative experiences were remarkably, in quotes, normal. Um, he uh, um, had some experiences with Jewish people, the most important probably being uh, his mother's doctor, uh, Dr. Bloch. Um, Dr. Bloch turned out to be in, an amazingly wonderful person, uh, humane, uh, and how do we know that? Did Hitler talk about that at some point? Well, actually, uh, Dr. Bloch did. Oh, okay. um, Hitler talked about it too, but uh, Dr. Bloch uh, remarkably survived. Um, Hitler got him out of, made sure he got out of Austria in 1938 when the Nazis uh, invaded and took over uh, and made sure he got out. So we know, we know a lot from... Um, Various, various sort of uh, contemporary witnesses, including Dr. Bloch, um, how he treated uh, at, some, at his own expense the poor woman who had uh, ended up with breast, a really painful case of breast cancer and died young. Um, we know that whatever else he did and all the, all the witnesses we could gather and the most uh, thorough research imaginable really has gone on uh, since um, even before uh, 1945, but certainly after 1945, to try to track where did Hitler become anti-Semitic. And the first evidence we have, and he had many other dealings with Jews besides his doctor, uh, Dr. Bloch, in fact, there's a new book out about Dr. Bloch who came to, who eventually made it to the United States um, and survived in the United States. Uh, but Hitler, uh, had many other experiences, in quotes, normal, really quite normal, even pleasant or uh, profitable experiences with Jews uh, in Vienna. Uh, he was, uh, he, he went through the war experiences. Uh, he was, he volunteered as um, uh, um, an infantryman in the First World War, served um, more or, you know, as far as we can tell, bravely, uh, won the Iron Cross first class. I mean, we can try to take it away from say, oh, you know, they were just giving him out that day kind of thing and he happened to be there. Uh, but he got the Iron Cross, uh, which is not that, uh, not which is quite something. Uh, the first time we have any evidence of his anti-Semitism uh, comes out in 1919. This is when the man is 30 years old. Until he's 30 years old, he's done practically nothing really with his life. He wanted to go to art school, failed to get in. He fancied himself, nevertheless, as an unrecognized genius. And he read books of, about other uh, artists and architects and great leaders who had been, in quotes, unrecognized geniuses just like him. And then all of a sudden in September 1919, he's, he's asked by his, um, uh, he's still in the military. Um, uh, where, where he's, he's learning to be a propagandist uh, in the military, peacetime military after the war, after the First World War. And he's asked to write this letter to a, a man who was heard one of the Hitler speeches and uh, asked to explain, like, what is, what's this anti, the guy asked, what's this anti-Semitism thing all about? And then Hitler writes him this uh, relatively short letter in which he shows an extraordinary amount of anti-Semitism. And not only that, but that he had become familiar with what I will call the canon of anti-Semitism, that is the main writings of anti-Semitism uh, prior to 1914. So do we, know not, where the, do we know where this was all birthed? I mean, do we know where this came from in him? We, we absolutely do not. And uh, people will, will give all kinds of hypotheses about how this came about or 
um, a, a nasty experience with Jews does not seem to have happened. You know, not, not a personal, you know, a personal yeah. autobiographical reason. So like they, for years, uh, people thought for a while, oh, his doctor was, the doctor was Jewish and uh, mistreated the, the mother. And uh, so, and, but that, that turned out to be a, a pile of hogwash. So we don't know where it came from. But it's, you know, there was an abundance, to put it mildly, an abundance of anti-Semitism uh, in Vienna when he was living there prior to the First World War. Uh, he lived there in incredibly poor uh, circumstances, scraping by by uh, painting postcards. He didn't paint houses. He painted, he, he fancied himself a painter. Some of these paintings survived. There were lots of forgeries too. But nevertheless, we you can't, uh, we can't say, okay, well, this is the moment when it happened. You know, this is the, this is the, the, the lightning moment when it happened. But from September 19, uh, 19 on, I mean, this becomes really, I mean, he starts then, from then on, uh, talking about the Jews as a, a tuberculosis that has, that has to be exterminated. I mean, right from the get-go, it's, I mean, I can't, no, we don't want to go so far as to say that he was planning or hoping or wishing for, the final solution, the mass murder of the Jews from 1919. We would, you don't need to go that far. But there's no doubt that from the very beginning, there were immediate uh, murderous implications in this anti-Semitism. In other words, this wasn't just a mild sort of case of, you know, oh, Jesus, I don't like Jews or they're too influential or something. He, he had the whole thing thought out. And the longer, I mean, only a couple of months later, he gave a two or three hour speech um, on why why the Nazi why the National Socialist Party is anti-Semitic. I mean, in which he goes into it in excruciating, painful and horrible um, detail. The detail and so forth of that speech we we can get it in English. You can get all these speeches. You can get you can't get them all in English, but you can get some of these main ones. Um, you can get online. You have to be careful of this of the sources because sometimes they're sort of. Uh, tampered with. That's why I go to the original German sources. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, when you see what, the, when you read the stuff that this man said right from the get-go, I am personally, as a, as a, as a professor of history, uh, teaching young uh, students, I'm really reluctant to ask them, say, you know, just read this, and this will give you an idea of what Hitler's anti-Semitism entailed, because it's just so awful uh, that, yeah, uh, you know, painful. I just don't, it's painful. I, I just don't want to do it. I, so, I think, you know, I think this is too much for um, for for uh, these young people to have to uh, have to cope with. You know, so we, there's some things we in in history, uh, in in uh, German history in particular, Nazi German history. There are some things that we just really, uh, it's they're too brutal, uh, too god awful, to just actually confront young people with. So. Any, anybody. Yeah, yeah, it's it's certainly tough to to read the details. So so you, you mentioned he was about thirty. So that would be about nineteen twenty eight, nineteen twenty nine or so. No, um, that, well, no. When he develops this anti semitism. No, you see, as far as I can see, eighteen eighty nine and nineteen nineteen is that is that not. 30 years? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, right, right. So that's 30 years, right. Excuse Although me. Although mathematicians, you know, I'm not a yeah. mathematician. And neither am I, clearly. So, so this is about 1919. <laughs> and, so, and, and so that's why the Treaty of Versailles is so important, um, because we do need to talk about German history. So explain a little bit about where German history is. Um, he's 30 years old. The Treaty of Versailles is signed. Um, Germany has to admit responsibility uh, to admit responsibility yeah. to disarm. So explain where was Germany and where the German people are as Hitler begins his rise, um, not only anti-Semitic uh, in terms of that, but in terms of becoming a leader. Well, the country is in um, uh, revolutionary upheaval in uh, beginning in November, actually slightly before November uh, 1918. Um, uh, Germany uh, um, signs an armistice on November the 11th. I mean, there's a revolution on November the 9th. Uh, Germany signs an armistice uh, agreeing to stop the shooting on uh, November the 11th, 1918, a date we in the United States still celebrate um, as a, a Veterans Day, correct? Uh, November the 11th. And so Germany has been defeated. Um, 
it's um, it, it's bad. But then again, there are no enemy troops in Germany. Um, um, the the peace to, to come that they hoped would be one um, that uh, Woodrow Wilson wanted, which was you know more or less a democratic peace, um, a, you know self determination, and people would be allowed to do this. Germany becomes tries to become overnight super democratic. But, but there's then, a, yeah, I was but, say, it, but a then in June in June 1919, uh, the terms of this treaty uh, become clear. And it, it turns out, oh, well, the First World War, it wasn't a tie. Germany really lost, and the peace is going to be horrendous. That's when they have to force us. If you don't sign the treaty, we're going, we will invade. And so this causes more uh, upheaval. Um, the government is determined under no circumstances to sign it. The first, the chancellor re resign, I mean, basically the, the head of government uh, resigns. Um, and it's in this context, you have communist revolutions, you have an attempted communist revolution uh, in January 1919, you have basically uh, upheaval, tumult, um, uh, all kinds of groups, um, small groups of um, um, anti-Semites uh, gather in various places all across Germany. There isn't a national uh, forum for them. But anti-Semitism uh, explodes not just in Hitler's mind, but he's a sort of representative figure for the for the for the blossoming mm -hmm. of anti-Semitism across the country. Um, there are some prominent Jews who are involved in these revolutions, and of course they also make the link to what had happened in Russia and the, the Jews who were supposedly responsible for the, I say supposedly responsible for the revolution in Russia. So so the Jews are linked into this. So you have outraged nationalism, and you have um, now vociferous, uh, radical uh, anti-Semitism. These are in the air. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And along with this, there's a cry. Thanks to the First World War, people got used to social programs. And no matter how, um, how uh, important they were at the time, if you introduce these kind of social programs, welfare programs, it's impossible to undo them. And so there's a cry for more social socialism. Socialist parties are extremely popular. And so what Hitler wants to do in a word is to unite inside one party, nationalism, socialism, and anti-Semitism. Now, those are the three most important, there's one more, but these are the three most important um, prongs of the, of the Nazi party program. Um, this is what, this, so, so in other words, Hitler doesn't have to convert the nation to these, to these beliefs. He is one amongst millions of others who believe, who believe the same thing. I mean, even Catholic parties, Catholic parties founded in Bavaria at this time are notable for their anti-Semitism. And you could go on. So it's not that Hitler, it, 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 what I, the reason I objected uh, and students don't agree with me, I have to say, not all of them anyway. <laughs> um, but the ones who want an A from me do, I just, that was a joke, that was a joke, I'm only kidding. Um, uh, it's easy to, be, to, to believe that it's all Hitler, that it's all one man, that this, and this is what uh, um, historians call a, a, a Hitler-centric view, that it's all Hitler, I tell you, he did it all, and so on. It's, and so, we, you know, many people looking at this from afar and from the outside, we think, oh, wow, that's amazing. He did all this. He created this. This guy was, um, a, in quotes, a genius of, of a sort, I guess, or something. He, and of course, uh, this theory is not helped by the fact that many uh, biographers, all his recent biographers, uh, lean to the theory of charisma. That is Hitler's charismatic appeal. It's his speaking ability. And this did it all. On that word. Yeah, you caution I, that word. Explain I, that. Yeah. I do, because it gives far too much credit to, the, to, to, the, to one single individual. I think this is a great misconception that we've gotten ourselves into lately. I mean lately in the last 10 years, that this is a one-man thing, uh, that this, is, this, was, this was it. When in fact, the, the, the strands of nationalism 
heightened nationalism, socialism, anti-Semitism. Uh, these, these, these things were coursing through German culture since well before 1914. And it wasn't necessary for one man to invent all these things. Hitler becomes, instead of the person who creates all these things, now it's inadvertent, you see, as soon as you mention the word charisma, it's immediately everything, all your attention, all the, all the reader's attention, all the listener's attention is focused on a single individual. As soon as you say the word charisma, you think, oh, this is um, Brad Pitt. Uh, plus, it's Brad Pitt. Plus, We're all uh, following this person. Yeah. yeah. It's just like the Pied Piper or something like this or whatever, whatever fairy tale you care to believe. Now, listen, we have to, if, if you look at the definitions of, of charisma today, I mean, there are dogs who have, have charismatic appeal. If you look up the word, um, uh, I mean, there's a set of towels and, um, and bedclothes that are, have a charismatic appeal. Valleys have charisma, for God's sake. You look out into this, I tell you, it's positively charismatic, and so on. So after a while, charisma means so many things that actually ends up meaning almost nothing except, gee, I guess really attractive or neat or cool whatever word you care to use. Whereas when, uh, I, what, when you see the, the pictures of Hitler's audiences before he even shows up, they look, what, I mean, we've, ha we've come across some recent pictures of, the, of, of this, these audiences. They look remarkably respectable, normal. They are not ranting. They don't look like they're, um, you know, uh, drooling at the mouth or, or that they have um, some sort of uh, Dracula blood in them or something. But they look incredibly normal, respectable, um, middle class, ordinary people. And so what I, how these people became National Socialism, National Socialists is, is, is like, what, how, where did the doctrine come from? The answer is, the doctrine was pretty much in the air. Everybody agrees it wasn't very original. Hitler put it together, Hitler and um, several of his um, of, um, fellows, colleagues, comrades, put it together briefly in uh, February 1920, and it became the ironclad, in quotes, ironclad program of the party, uh, 25 points. Um, uh, I can summarize the points, but. If you read, if you look it up, if people look up online, the Nazi party program of 1920, you will see that it is A, remarkably nationalistic, B, full of socialism. For example, the biggest, uh, the biggest statement coming out of it or the biggest slogan that comes out of it is the common good before individual good. It's full of anti-Semitism, uh, nationalism, uh, and socialism. So what is Hitler's skill? We're at this point here where Germany is humiliated um, on the world stage, um, and Hitler is now riding this tide of, of sentiment, and he's able to um, bring these forces and get them behind him. So um, if the word is not charismatic, what is the skill? Excuse oh, me. If, if the word is not charismatic, what is the skill that he has? Okay, I, okay, I'm not against as such, you know, the word charismatic if people want to use it, but the problem is it tends, it tends, to, it tends to be exaggerated. It te we tend to credit it, everything with his, somehow his speaking ability or you know, something like that. Having said that, there is absolutely no question that Hitler was um, ha you know, a skillful, very skillful speaker. Uh, he had... Um, he had seen many operas from, from the time he was very young. He, he saw a Wagner opera, uh, something that like three or four hours long. And as a, as a young kid, um, I don't know if I saw that as a young kid, if I would have thought, well, man, this is where it's at. But he did. And he studied all the opera and he knew he was aware of a stage uh, presence and state and a set design. And so he was, he was no fool, and he could definitely speak. Um, and what his, his, his great gift was that he brought together these diverse um, parties that were all over the place, and uh, ma they managed to find in him a, 
a common denominator they could uh, unite around. And um, even though there were, there were loose groups inside this, uh, the early party until uh, 1923, there were loose groups inside it, uh, he, he was the unifying figure. They could, they could agree on this. There were, more, there were some people in there who were more, more socialist, others were in fact not socialist at all. And he managed to bring them together and his great gift was that he, he kept them together. At various other times during the, the rise to power, now the party is, uh, vanished in 1923 when they try to get in power illegally, and then he adopts, when he gets out of prison, uh, a, a legal course. And so they, they, they be, have to become conventional political party. And he is uh, skillful. There's no question about that. He's, he was skillful in recognizing the things that that would need that needed to be done, but we should be under no um, uh, illusion. It took Hitler from uh, the time of the foundation of the party in 1920 to uh, January 1933 when he's um, appointed chancellor. That's thir That is, by my count, 13 years. So he but he didn't they didn't get into power overnight. So as much as Hitler contributed, until the Great Depression came. Yeah, that, uh, that was my next th question. But yeah, this is this is this is until the Great Depression. These are still voices in the wilderness. They're getting one or two percent or even less of the vote. I mean, they're an insignificant uh, fringe group. Uh, and what makes them possible, uh, in my opinion, is the Great Depression. No Great Depression, no National Socialism, and no Hitler. And one thing you argue is that um, concrete positive changes in everyday life had um, a bigger influence in getting him power than did the propaganda and the speeches. And you say Nazism needed the economic misery at first in order to thrive. So I guess go a little bit more into that, explain that. And um, what did it do for people beyond giving this platform of hate? Well, you know, what happens is that uh, the working class in Germany is very committed to voting socialist uh, or communist. And so the big parties, uh, the big parties uh, that Hitler is competing with are the socialists and communist parties. Um, uh, in 1932, in the, in the last elections of 1932, 71% of the parties, uh, who, uh, the votes, 71 a percent of the votes go for parties that have either socialist or communist or words like that in their title. So that will tell you that by the end of 1932, the vast majority of the people in Germany wanted some, something, I'll just call it for no, want of a, a better word, they wanted more socialism. Hitler, uh, and of course, where did this come from? Well, the answer is not all the people who were workers, uh, once they became unemployed, immediately they said, oh, we're going to vote Nazi. But what happens is uh, when you see all these people becoming unemployed, the middle classes in small towns and so forth all over Germany look and see the lines of the welfare, you know, welfare uh, office growing longer every day. This is, this is depressing. And an important thing about the Great Depression that we often um, overlook is that it is a Great Depression in the sense that it's a psychological depression too. It is depressing. Now we're living in the middle of a of a of this pandemic and all the rest, the other things that are going on simultaneously, and that's depressing too. So we have we, we should be able to identify the sense that you know this this psychological depression, and what happens is that Hitler Hitler says, look. When I get in there, he doesn't offer um, a shopping list. Like, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna give you A, B, C, D, and so forth. He doesn't operate like that. What he operates is that there's going to be fundamental change. There's gonna be, we need, to we need to have these fundamental changes. Germany has to be better and so forth. He, he, he keeps hammering away uh, at an alternative society that he wants. He never really specifies like, how, what does this look like? But this alternative society is called the community of the people. What we're gonna do is get rid of all this fighting in the streets. I mean, 
Hundreds and thousands of people were being injured in the streets in street battles from 1929 to 33. I mean, many people were killed in street battles amongst political parties in the streets. Now, we think we have a, a rough political discourse. Well, this was as rough as could possibly be. I mean, yeah, we'll show you rough, right? Yeah. Really, really bad. Yeah. And of course, this is the absolute, absolute opposite of what good citizens, I put in quotes, good citizens don't want this. In addition, there was a farm crisis uh, beginning even before the Great Depression. And the farm crisis meant uh, pe people's, the, the price that people could get for their, for their um, crops, uh, for their produce, uh, kept falling. Uh, in, oh, sort of inexplicably, why are the prices falling? Why the more the harder I work and the more I produce, the less I'm making. And this also drove a lot of farmers, um, got them ready for something different. We need some, we need some, something different, someone who's going to do something uh, to, to set things right. And the great appeal was the community of the people. We'll end all this struggle in the street, all the fighting, all the squabbling, and the endless elections, and the and the, and the complaining, and the, and the, uh, bring back some semblance of law and order. Um, so that's what we need. Do, do do these do these ordinary Germans um, do they um, are they attracted to Hitler um, because of the anti-Semitism or in spite of the anti-Semitism, and they were basically willing to excuse it? Well, I, this is the, the, the very important question. Um, probably the most difficult or most controversial part of uh, this book and this all my research into uh, this side of the rise of the part, Nazi party is that it's extremely difficult to recreate the motivations of voters. I mean, are you voting for this person in spite of uh, his uh, prejudices or because of them? It's very difficult uh, to, to, to get into the mind of all the voters. Now, what I did do is I looked at all the people who became leaders and what, what their beliefs were. Then in the next chapter, I looked at all the people who were the militants and what they believed in. And then I looked at the voters to try to get at it this, this way. Um, and what is uh, perhaps surprising is that in the last elections of 19, uh, in 1932, uh, there were five or six national elections. I think it's five or, five or six national elections in 1932 alone. So, so there were two presidential elections. Um, uh, and um, uh, 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 and also um, uh, what we would call congressional elections. So it was uh, a, a constant uh, sort of um, uh, constant mobilization and uh, no sense of normality. Uh, you know, almost some people have said, uh, maybe an exaggeration, close to something like civil war in the streets and people wanted a return to, I'll put in quotes, some kind of normality, um, some sort of semblance of what, the good old days. And this idea of the Volksgemeinschaft, well, this is this harmonious community of the people. What about anti-Semitism? Hitler plays it down. Um, the Nazis, the Nazis, when they uh, electioneer, uh, when they go into areas or communities or um, certain localities, which, is no, which are known to be anti-Semitic or known to be, have a, a, a history, when they know a history of anti-Semitism, then they play it up. But otherwise, it's kind of uh, soft-pedaled so that you can't say, well, every vote for the Nazi party in 1932 meant a vote for, for anti-Semitism. The perennial, but, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the, for, yeah, but even though they didn't vote, even though people did not vote um, as such, let's say there was person A or B or so who did not vote because of, they had still had to know that this party was the most anti-Semitic political party in all of Germany's history. And so the, per, the perennial question um, is always, how could these ordinary people have supported this? How could they have not known what was going on in the concentration camps and eventually the death camps. Um, so the question is, 
what did they know and when did they know it? Well, uh, in 1933, um, uh, Hitler's appointed in January the, January the 30th, 1933, and there is um, some immediate, um, uh, act, there are some immediate actions, violence uh, against the Jews, but relatively moderate. Um, there is a boycott of Jewish businesses in April uh, 1933. Um, that's still relatively moderate. You know, um, you have the Nazi goons standing outside of store saying, you know, don't shop here. Uh, this is a Jewish business, things like that. It's definitely highly unpleasant, but it's not murderous. Now, they, there are uh, things I document in the book where uh, the Jews are beaten and led to, through town, and it's, it's just awful, and people have to know about it. But, um, and there are concentration camps, but these are mainly for political people. That is to say for communists, socialists, some Catholics, people like that. The opposition. There are Jews, there, the opposition. <laughs> there are Jews uh, thrown in there too, but that's not the primary, they are not the primary target. And then in 1935, you get the Nuremberg Laws, which for, see how these are, these are, these are um, step by step, the radicalism picks up. I mean, Hitler was determined to be um, a popular leader. So he was, he was also meant to be a popular leader in Germany. He, he looked at the revolutions in 1918 in Germany and said, there, oh, there are mistakes were that, you know, uh, they didn't have popularity on their side. They also- He ignored, knows he needs the support of the people, yeah. Absolutely. And so the Nazis proceed with their anti-Semitism and uh, including creating the concentration camps by feeling out popular support. Um, the, the radicalization seems to um, uh, fade off somewhat in the 1930s. Uh, the economy is booming, everything is going great. Uh, Germany gets in 1936, the Olympic games, winter and summer, um, uh, a, a huge propaganda coup. So things calm down or relatively calm until November 1938 when we get the first full-fledged program, the notorious Night of Broken Glass or Kristallnacht. Um, this leads to the arrest of uh, 30,000 Jews and um, uh, these are put in concentration, uh, these men, all male, uh, are put in concentration camps. They are let out, these people will be allowed out when they uh, can show that they're gonna be leaving the country. Uh, some of these people are killed, but it's still, I say, I'll put this in quotes, uh, uh, moderate compared to anything that's gonna happen later. Um, so we do don't know why German, people- hmm? Do ordinary Germans eventually figure out what's going on in the concentration camps and do they support it? What is, well, okay, there's one, I tried to answer, I tried to, I've tried, I've been trying and not, not, not me alone, but many have been trying to figure this question out for years. Um, uh, one indication, one indication of how um, this, how what was happening to the Jews in Poland um, after 19, you know, after September 39, when the war begins, or after June 41, when the war against the Soviet Union begins, the, each one of these steps, the war in 39, and especially the attack on the Soviet Union in 41, these lead to um, what I will call death squads in the East, going around um, uh, murdering Jews, uh, shooting them in the streets, often, um, and then or and or leading them to the forest. And so people absolutely had to know this. Now, how much of this word got back to Germany? Um, that that is a that is a, a, a puzzle. We're still uh, trying to under, unravel that. Uh, we have diaries from the time of people who lived in Germany. Uh, one of the most interesting or the ones uh, of a set of these diaries uh, are diaries kept by Jewish people. Uh, what did they know? I figured. No, if, you, if you look at what the I mean, these are, these people are really interested in finding out what the hell is going on there. Uh, we're, you know, there's, our neighbors have been sent away. Where are they? Are we get, you know, they, they get a phony note or something back from them, something like that, whatever. These things, they, they can't, they, you know, they're trying to figure out what's going on. 
So they find out that some awful things are happening in a place called, that sounds and looks, it sounds like Auschwitz, but they hear about it a year after it happened, or they hear about this mass pogrom uh, in Babi Yar in Kiev, Ukraine, which takes place in uh, uh, um, September, October, 1941. And on the weekend there, on the weekend, 33,000 Jews are murdered, shot in, into a valley called Babi Yar. And the, the Jews in Germany, who are keeping diaries, uh, record this, but a year after it happened. So in other words, um, the, the news uh, does get through uh, in bits and pieces, uh, but uh, always with a delay and, um, you know, it's wartime, everything, everything is under lock and key. All of these things are supposed to be secret, but there's no doubt that re soldiers returning on leave, uh, people like that, they were all talking, but exactly what they knew, exactly how many people knew it, um, is something we've been, we will never pin down um, with any degree of uh, absolute certainty. Mm. Uh, um, so then the other question, the, yeah, the, the other question would be, were there Germans who disagreed? Not, I mean, we don't know that they knew about what was going on in the death camps, but were there Germans, ordinary ones, who disagreed with the general direction and the tone and, and the, the dictatorship that had developed? Oh yeah, well yes, there are. Of course, there there are there are people who disagree. And what becomes of um, them? And how do they express it? I guess is the way is what, how you have to be really careful. Well, absolutely right. I mean, they they the Nazis introduce in early thirty three. They introduce uh, um, uh, laws, for example, uh, against in quotes malicious verbal attacks on the government. Think about that one for a second. They they also um, uh, in February 1933, get rid of all uh, the rights we associated with, let's say, our Bill of Rights, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, freedom of speech. All of these things are whittled away. Uh, people learn to live with it. Uh, there is opposition. It's, it has to, it's either driven out of the country or underground. The underground opposition is small and it's not very well um, united. And of course, what happens is that as the regime, un, I mean, Germany got National Socialism because of the Depression, and when Hitler is Hitler and company are the first to really beat the Great Depression by 1936 or 37, at the latest, the Great Depression in Germany is beaten. It's a long way from being beaten in Britain or, or the United States by that time. So this is an enormous boost um, to Hitler's popularity and makes uh, opposition to uh, him uh, more difficult. Uh, the Allies, Britain and France at that time, were doing everything possible, bending over backwards to appease Hitler uh, in foreign policy, for example. Let, you know, when 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 he would uh, break the Treaty of Versailles over and over again, they they just either looked the other way or excused it or something else, and that made Hitler look even greater. So here he was, you see, the, the, the great man now, suddenly uh, 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 at the head of, the, of a winning team. Um, and Germany was rearming. And, you know, part of nationalism is, 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 is uh, um, enjoying parades in the military uh, and na nationalists routinely want a, a larger armed forces, larger military more assertive military. And it feels and so good that, to be part of all this, in it's, other words. It's, it is. It's very good to be part of this. I mean, uh, I mean, and the Nazis introduced a whole set of uh, what I can, I'll call socialist programs. Um, uh, for example, um, um, uh, what to do in your free time, uh, what, to, what to do after, after your work is over, um, all kinds of programs, uh, um, cheap tourists, um, uh, um, so you could visit places, uh, or um, they introduced a, a, a little thing called uh, the people's car, uh, the Volkswagen. The Volkswagen was part of these, was just one part of the social programs. Now, so can we, can, can, we, can we put them into 
the neat little boxes that we do in the United States today of left wing and right wing? It's, that is a really difficult thing to do. That's a good question, though, because, um, well, in some ways they are, of course, right wing, but uh, in, in other ways they are left wing. It's, uh, hence, the, there is this sort of uh, contradiction or a seeming c conflict between nationalistic and socialistic. There is this, you know, they're, they're, they're um, running up the deficit. Uh, they're building a huge military uh, and so forth. This is what presumably the right wants, uh, but they're also introducing social programs. Uh, they, they ran, made it sound like they were going to get rid of all welfare programs, but now let's just say for the sake of, it is the first winter of the, of the National Socialist regime. Are they really going to let people die on the sidewalks? Well, no, they introduce soup kitchens and, and, and so on and on and on it goes. They have other programs for mother and child, looking after, uh, um, looking after people, uh, old people, guaranteeing young people that they would have, uh, that education would be open to them, that there'd be no more class barriers. You know, there were people who, uh, I've read their diaries, people who, for example, uh, in their, in, no one in their family in Germany had ever seen the mountains or the ocean. And now Hitler was providing these uh, various programs to not only give this person a job, but the possibility of actually learning to how to ski in the mountains and actually going on a trip on the ocean. And this was, you know, somehow this was the great man. They didn't get the, the Volkswagen that they, were, that, they were, that they were promised, but through all the all the, the, the ad advertising around it, all the color pictures that they uh, um, um, put in the press and so forth, people got uh, what, what one historian called virtual consumption. They, they, could, you know, they could imagine themselves as having their own car, driving on the, uh, on the Autobahn, uh, going on vacation, things that were for, that, for their families unheard of before. And so you, you have this regime by 1939, if any, I mean, by, by 1941, let me put it this way, by October, November 1941, um, that's not, I mean, he started politics in 1920. Uh, now it's 41, so it's just 21 years later. So in 1920, Hitler is a nobody. And in uh, the, the fall of 1941, he's the most popular and the most powerful leader in the world by far. So it, 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 that's why it's, and, and that's why this is such an incredible story. And he's leading the most educated nation on earth. The last question I want to ask is when the war is over, when World War II is over, um, did ordinary Germans look back after more information had come out about what was going on and go, boy, were we wrong? It's, that's an interesting question. In 1948, um, they they uh, did a survey uh, about national socialist uh, um, doctrine. This is the question they asked: Do you consider national socialism to be a good idea that was poorly implemented? Now this is in 1948. Fifty-seven percent said they thought it was a, go a good idea, poorly implemented. Fifty-seven percent. Uh, Twenty-eight percent said no, and fifteen percent were undecided. So if you add the undecided to the, uh, the ones who said yes, you get close to 70% of the people who were saying in 1948 that they thought that national socialism was a good idea, poorly implemented. And there they are standing in the wreckage uh, of, of an and unbelievably so large war. Yes. And they, they did the survey uh, later again uh, several years later again, and it was down somewhat, but it was still above 50%. Something like two-thirds of the population in Germany was involved in some aspect of the Nazi, Nazi party, Nazi uh, organizations. So, a trim, and th they were, they were re re you know, some people did it for opportunistic reasons, but it would be, you know, ludicrous for us to think this was all opportunism. A lot of people, you know, became true believers. Um, I mean, 
honestly, I don't know how this book is going to go down, you know, how, how ordinary people became, um, became Nazis. I don't know how people are going to respond to it. It's not a, it's not, but I mean, it, I've tried to tell the truth the best I can. I've used the, the best sources that, that are available, original sources, German sources. Uh, some people have complained, I already complaining that, that these were published after 1945. Well, some sources were only found after 1945. Some sources, for example, were only put together by historians after 1945. Uh, but I've tried to use as much original documentation. I've always tried to go to the original documentation, the best I can get. And, you know, this is, I write these books with a, a view that um, I'm trying to, to do the best thing I can to, to tell the story as justly and as uh, open-mindedly as I can to the victims of, of this regime, uh, as well as the people who were... Um, supporters or people who are um, German today. I, I'm, I'm trying to be as objective and fair as I, as I can be. Professor Robert Galatly, uh, the author of Hitler's True Believers, How Ordinary People Became Nazis. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Evan. Thank you. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports History and Today, Conversations with America's Top Nonfiction Authors and Why Their Books Matter Right Now. Be sure to check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and with book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.